Well, welcome back to my channel. I'm going to talk about something that I get asked all the time from both student and consulting audiences. And namely, that is, what is the difference between the resource based view of strategy and also known as RBV, the resource-based view of strategy, and Porterian views of strategy, or Porter's view of strategy, depending on how you want to call it. And so in order to attack this problem, I'm going to talk about in this video a few th about a few things. Um, and if you're familiar with these, I know not everybody is kind of a business major, so I'm kind of breaking it down very simply. But in order to kind of effectively address RBV versus, versus the Proterian view of strategy, we're going to first talk about inductive versus deductive reasoning. Then we'll talk about the means versus the ends of a firm. And then we'll talk about Porterian versus Ricardian rents. And then I'll kind of tie all three of those contrasts together. And then you should have a very strong understanding of the differences between a resource-based view of strategy versus a Porterian view of strategy. Now, if you need just a little extra incentive to watch the rest of this video, you'll probably notice that I'm using colored chalk in this video. And the challenge for me will be to see if I can make it through the entire video without getting colored chalk all over my white shirt. So stick around to the end and see if I can pull it off. I'm doubtful that I'll make it. So the first part that we need to look at is inductive reasoning versus deductive reasoning. And as it just so happens, inductive reasoning is... An orientation for resource-based view of strategy and Michael Porter's is more of a deductive based. So what's the difference? Well part of it I would say is almost a geographical type of difference. You could say that uh, North Americans tend to work on deductive reasoning and Europeans tend to work more on inductive reasoning at least in terms of management slash business research. Let me kind of draw them out a little bit for you. Or let me, let me give a metaphor and then I'll draw it on the board. Deductive reasoning says I think I know what the answer is and I'm going to collect some data to gather a hypothesis to determine whether I'm right or wrong. That's deductive reasoning. Now those of you who have taken like a science class in high school, college, or otherwise may be familiar with deductive reasoning. You do your hypothesis testing. I think that cells are going to grow at a certain rate or something like that and then you test it, you measure it, and then your hypothesis is either supported or not. That's a deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning on the other hand is more of a I don't really know exactly what to expect at all, but I'm going to go in with an open mind, gather some data, and then theorize about it afterwards. Okay? Now, is one approach better than another? I don't know. You'll have to tell me. I always consider that deductive, oops, I'm pointing the wrong one. Deductive reasoning is more kind of a scientific based reasoning, and inductive reasoning is more of kind of an artistic, creative type of reasoning. Um, is, you know, are they smarter people that go one way or the other? I, I don't know. Is, I don't know. Is Michelangelo a bigger genius than Einstein? I, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. If you do have a particular opinion on it, feel free to comment it uh, on there in the bottom. Or if you want to use a pop culture example, Mr. Inductive Reasoning is none other than the great late Bob Ross. And if you don't know who Bob Ross is, check him out on YouTube. He has a, a show called The Joys of Painting. He had kind of like a, a curly 
sort of hairstyle. And the way it was presented is, you know, he never really knew what he was going to paint. He'd just kind of be painting on a canvas. He'd say, oh, you know, that's not a mistake. It's a happy accident. I'm going to turn that cloud into, you know, a tree branch or something like that. So as he was going, there was kind of an iterative process, an iterative interaction between him and the canvas. Deductive reasoning, though, I always think of as MacGyver. And I understand there's a new MacGyver show on TV, but I'm talking about the, uh, the MacGyver of the 1980s. For those of us that grew up in the 80s, there's only one MacGyver. It's Richard Dean Anderson, and you know that's really the end of the discussion. And I always consider him Mr. Mr. Deductive. In other words, he's locked in a room. He doesn't, you know, know how to get out, so he's got a hypothesis. I can gather a, a paper clip, a toothpick, a chewing gum, and a match. And somehow I'll get out of here. Or will I? Right? So he knows exactly what he wants at the end. Can he gather up the resources to do that or not? Allow me to present um, this inductive deductive debate a little bit differently. Some of you may have taken statistics. Okay? Those of you that have, this will make a lot of sense. Those of you who haven't, this won't make much sense at all. So you'll stick with the MacGyver slash Bob Ross uh, reference. But let's say you've got some data points, okay. and I say, you know what, um, I think that my bell curve will look kind of, I think my bell curve will look kind of like this, okay? So do my data points support my hypothesis or not? My hypothesis is that the bell curve looks like this. I go out, I take some measurements. And you know what? It turns out that I'm right. Okay? That's fine. Now, inductive reasoning could be, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen. So I just gather a bunch of data points, and then I draw my curve afterwards. Okay? You know, when I was in graduate school, there was this uh, guy in my program named Giacomo, and you know, this inductive deductive reasoning example that my students always remember. And Giacomo would always say, um, you know, he comes to me, and, I, and by the way, Giacomo never made any effort to learn English at all. And he even lived in France uh, with a French lady and never bothered to learn French either. It was just all Italian for Giacomo. And so Giacomo says, hey, can you start teaching me English? And so we kind of had this arrangement where as long as he cooked for me and put drinks in front of me. I was basically his hostage, and he was a really good cook, so it worked out for me. So I'm working with him on his English and, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, after six months, I finally said, Giacomo, you're making some progress, but why are you even bothering to learn English? You know, you're so good at math, you're going to be a great researcher, even if you can't speak English correctly. And he said, I want to go to Brazil, and I want to talk to people at Carnival there. So Giacomo had a theory, hypothesis, that everybody in Brazil speaks English. But then I pointed out to him that actually the language of, of Brazil is Portuguese. And he looked at me and said, oh. And so I should have kept my mouth shut because then I lost all those great Italian meals all the time. Um, he stopped learning English at that point. That killed his motivation to, to, to try. So, all right. So that's inductive versus deductive reasoning. This is the resource-based view. This is uh, the Porterian view. Okay, let's move in to the next concept. And that's the ends of the firm versus the means of the firm. Now remember I mentioned to MacGyver, uh, the MacGyver example for Michael Porter, okay? So if you know exactly what you wanna do at the end and you wanna test it to see if you're the best, you're gonna focus on the ends or the goals of a firm, okay? And here are the ends of the firm. And I have some videos on a playlist called Introduction to Strategy where I go into this in more depth if you're interested. Uh, I'll put the description at some point, uh, or the link to that uh, playlist at some point down in the description of this video. But, yeah, so we got the ends of the firm. Let me see if I can use some of this colored chalk without getting on my white shirt. See if I can do it. I'm already off to a bad start, it looks like. All right, so ends of the firm, as so I'm kind of moving around here. The first one would be growth. Okay. 
Growth is, in other words, a firm needs to grow, it needs to expand, and it needs to get bigger. Okay? So a potential end or a goal of a firm is getting larger than it is now. Okay? Apple is a great example, right? They start off as kind of a smaller niche kind of company, and now it's one of the largest, if not the largest, by market cap on the stock exchange. Clearly, it has grown. Okay? The second is profit. Okay? Profit. Profit basically means just like it sounds. Earning hard economic cash, right? You're you're making money. Okay? The next one is social. And that's basic there's a little chalk on the shirt. And that's basically some sort of intrinsic goal, right? It's um, maybe not so much profit in terms of hard economic cash, but it's psychic profit. It's psychic income. In other words, I want to do great for the world. I want to make the world a better place. I want to feel good. I want to you know, attain some other societal or community-based benefit. That's social. And then the one that I always like to put in that a lot of people forget is the environmental, right? Environmental. Peter just turned off on me there for a second. Environmental means that the, one of the potential uh, goals or the ends of a firm is some sort of an environmental benefit. Now, you know, I'm telling you when this, you can check when the upload date is, uh, but you'll notice that right now we've got uh, a big debate in politics about firms having some sort of environmental responsibility, and that could be a potential uh, goal of a firm. Now, to my viewers, if you can think of any others, definitely put them in the comments and I'll give you a response. Okay. So, under Porter's view, the firm focuses on the end point. It focuses on growth, profit, a social goal or environmental goal, and most importantly, all of these goals are going to be relative to the external competition. So, as, And I'm going to keep hammering and kind of hinting at it and teasing it out, but one of the big differences between Porter's and Jay Barney's or the resource-based view of strategy is that Porter's view is looking outside exogenously. Okay. It's also okay. It's exogenous. Therefore, you're looking. You're focusing on the competition, the other firms, and. The resource base view is endogenous. Okay. In other words, it's looking towards the inside of the firm for competitive advantage. So according to Michael Porter, because you focus on the ends of the firm, your source of competitive advantage derives from your ability to grow faster, generate more profit, generate better social goals, and better environmental firms than other firms in the market. So it's looking outside. Resource-based view of the firm, however, focuses more on the means of the firm. Sorry, don't think I need to write means again. So there's different kinds of means of the firm. And the first is resources. Okay? A resource in a firm is anything that is tangible. Okay? It can mean money, finances, capital. It can be the desks, the chairs, the equipment, and the factories themselves of a given firm. Okay? Alternatively, resources can, can also be human capabilities or human resources that could be measured like on a resume. In other words, I can say, well, you know, Bob is an engineer, Bob has an engineering degree, you know, so Dave has an MBA. You know, these are things that can be put on a resume, on a CV, and therefore they would also fall in to the category of resources. Another one that you want to consider is knowledge and know-how. Knowledge and know-how is a little bit harder to put your finger on though. So you can see, it's a little bit harder to put your finger on. It's that tacit stuff that just kind of happens. It's the magic that happens in the workplace. You know, it's like, um, 
I have this buddy that I, I work on papers with him. And, you know, he and I get to talking, we get to jiving, and there's just kind of this magic that happens. I can't really explain to you how it happens. It just does. You know, you and your cubicle mate, you know, you're just a great team together. And, you know, when you work with somebody else, the magic just isn't there for whatever reason. That's knowledge and know-how. It's different than resources because resources, again, you can say exactly what it is. You're an engineer, an MBA, PhD, you know, you're a CPA, whatever. That's, that's pretty obvious. But that kind of synergy that's going on, this is your knowledge and your know-how. Okay? And a lot of firms benefit from this kind of knowledge and know-how. Um, again, I like to pick on Google. I think they're a great example. Somehow, they have picked the right kinds of people, and they all just kind of feed off each other, and it creates this uh, kind of wacky, synergistic environment that's very hard to imitate. Now, related to that is culture. That's kind of the culture within a firm, right? And we always try to explain exactly what culture is, and you know, yet we don't exactly know what it is. Now, those of you that worked during the 1990s will remember those motivational posters. You know, it'd have like a droplet of water and say integrity and, you know, tenacity to be like some people on a rower or something like that. And I was in the Army uh, my, my previous life and, you know, they'd have these things like, you know, the Army values and, you know, it'd be some guy, you know, we're going to you know, face with his war paint on, and that would indicate, you know, one of the army values and, and different things like that. I think people made fun of these posters so much because, let's face it, what does a droplet of water and a ripple have to do with integrity? I mean, I, nobody could ever figure it out. But this was an attempt to explain in quite hard terms what culture is. Now, of course, you can also find examples of culture in a firm's mission statement. So a lot of firms say, well, you know, here at GE or whatever, you know, we strive to be the best, um, we have a culture of excellence and all that kind of stuff. You can kind of articulate it. This knowledge and know-how piece, though, if you say, well, why, you know, what's going on here? You say, well, that's, that's just the way things are done here, around here. You know, those two just work well together. You know, it, it just is. That's more of the knowledge and know-how, whereas culture you can actually articulate quite well. Okay? And then the last one is structure. Okay. Structure is basically the way a firm itself is structured. Okay. In other words, is this a franchise? Is it a multinational corporation? Does it have a matrix kind of structure? And this is, again, something that a firm has at its disposal, but it's looking inside. Okay. So the resource-based view of strategy focuses more on the means of a firm, whereas the portarian view focuses more on the ends. So for resource-based view, your competitive advantage comes from looking inside the firm, and Michael Porter's viewpoint says it comes from looking outside the firm. Now, the last piece, the last kind of concept that you need to understand before we actually get into how this, these two definitions clash. And it stems from Porterian versus Ricardian rents. We've got Porterian rents and Ricardian rents. Maybe I should go back to orange. I think you can see them. Okay, let's see if yellow looks better. Porterian and Ricardian rents examine in a very fundamental way what our understanding of a macroeconomic condition is. Okay? Porterian rents are probably the older tradition in an understanding of the economy. I know that it dates back at least to the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, you think about this. There was an understanding or belief that there was a finite amount of wealth in the world, and in order to make more money, you had to take money away from someone else. Okay, you had to take money away from someone else. And you'll find this in certain communities throughout the world where they have this notion of limited good. So because I'm getting wealthy, therefore I'm taking money away from someone else. And you also hear these kinds of dialogues and politics. Allow me to draw this for you. Okay, 
okay? Here's a circle kind of representing the total amount of wealth in the world. Think of it like a piece of pie. Now, under the Porterian view, again, you are looking at your competitive advantage exogenously by looking outside the firm and into the market. So you can make your, yourself some goals, like for profit, okay? In other words, I want to get this amount of wealth. Okay, that's a goal. And because I have that amount of wealth, it means all these other competitors don't get that. Okay? And in fact, I can even make a goal of growth that I want to get this big. But because now I've expanded here, that means somebody else can't get this kind of wealth here. And so in order to have a, a true competitive advantage, you need to engage, defeat, and destroy your competition. Strategy is very much like war. There's only this amount of wealth in the world. We got to get to it somehow. Okay. Compare that to a Ricardian rent for the resource-based view. Under the Ricardian rent, we see the world like so. This is the amount of wealth we have. And we say, you know what? I wonder if we can take some of these things that we got kind of going on inside the firm and recombine them in new ways and instead of competing in an existing market we recombine them in new ways and we create new markets in other words by recombining our resources knowledge know-how structure and culture we can create demands and needs that didn't exist before okay so the market looks like here at point a then we create a new market and we can continue to grow without, necess without necessarily taking away from other people or other companies, okay? And let's think about this, right? Let's compare two different approaches. I'm going to pick on Apple because I think this is the best illustration of it. Apple, back in the 90s, could have said, the only way that we're going to get bigger is by taking away uh, market share from Microsoft. So we're going to engage in a head-on war with Microsoft. We're going to just, yeah, we're going to take it to them. Yeah. For turn view strategy. Okay. Versus, well, you know, here at Apple, instead of saying that we have to grow and make profit by taking away from Microsoft, and we can have our goal of being number one, but we don't have to do it by taking away from them. Instead, what we can do is focus on the things that we do well already. Well, we have a pretty good client base. It's very loyal. Okay. That's a resource. We have um, a variety of knowledge pathways within Apple. We do know how um, to make computers really well. We know how to make computers fun and easy to use for everybody. We do have a culture perpetuated by Steve Jobs that glorifies innovation. And you know, in our headquarters, there's this weird kind of quirky uh, creativity thing going on that we don't exactly know how to describe. And based on structure, our people have a lot of autonomy. Hmm wonder what we could do. Well, let's kind of branch out a little because our, you know, our people know a lot about music. What if we kind of started, you know, this iTunes thing? Let's kind of see what happens. And then so they kind of, the market grows a little bit because now there's this kind of thing, this market for digital music that was kind of going on at the same time. And well, we kind of know about computers and we kind of know about uh, music. Um, you know, what if we like tried to miniaturize one of our computers and make it kind of like an iPod so that you can have music everywhere you go? Wow, okay, now the, the, the market for portable music is, is kind of growing, so you know the circle continues to grow. And then what if we take that same thing? We know how we know about internet, we know about computers, we know about music, and what if we come up with an iPhone? Suddenly, there's a huge market that didn't exist before. A market for technology that could do music, internet. A telephone all at the same time. It brings them all together. And I think about this, especially the digital music. Back when I was growing up, you went to the CD store and you sit there and you'd complain because every artist would have a CD and you only wanted one song on the CD, right? But then they had like the 19 other crap songs that you didn't care anything about. So what did you do? You didn't buy the CD or you bought the CD and you said never again. But wow, with the iTunes, you could buy one song at a time and you could listen to your music anywhere you wanted because let's face it, the boom boxes with the music blaring in your ear and the clunky Walkmans, it just wasn't doing it for a lot of people. Think about, you know, cell phones. Wow, I mean, you remember, you know, these things, you unfold, and they're huge. 
you know, like Dom Jolly on Trigger Happy TV, you know, big thing, bad reception. Again, Apple starts opening up all these other markets and reaching all sorts of new people. And it didn't necessarily take away share from Microsoft, right? They tried the Zune and some other things too, but that's, a, that's another story, right? So this is fundamentally the difference between resource-based view of strategy and Michael Porter's bit, um, understanding of strategy, the Porterian view. It's based on these Ricardian versus Porter's uh, uh, Porterian rents. It's based on looking inside the firm and recombining things in new ways for your competitive advantage versus looking outside the firm and trying to beat your competition. It's focused on deductive reasoning. Okay, In other words, I know exactly what I'm going to get and I'm going to take it. and I'm going to hypothesis test. If I'm wrong, I have to re-theorize versus, you know what? Let's just kind of go by the seat of our pants. I'll give one more example to hopefully kind of clarify uh, this reasoning. Uh, Henry Rensburg gave a great example in one of his articles, and he says, I guess his wife is a potter. I guess that'd be the term for uh, she makes ceramic things. And he described how she makes a pot. And, you know, she interacts with the clay. She goes, she has a generalized aspiration uh, of what she wants it to look like. But, you know, as the water and the, the clay and the wheel and everything it interacts. And in the process of, you know, this interaction between herself, the clay, the, the, the means at her disposal, the, the formation or the creation of the pot or the vase actually takes on a life of its own. Right? It's a very interactive sort of a process. That's quite different than making a mold for a pot or a vase and determining exactly what you want at the end. I hope this, uh, this discussion is helpful. Um, if you like this video, thumbs up or much appreciated, definitely subscribe. And if you have any questions, you can comment down below. And I do respond to comments. So, yeah, I really appreciate all uh, sticking through and watching uh, with me to the end. Um, oh, the, man, the main answer, did I get chalk on myself? I don't know, but I'm going to be making a lot more videos, and I guarantee it's going to happen. So you better watch some more of them and see if I can manage to make it through. All right, thanks again for watching. And I will talk to all of you later.